The reason I came to the Senate is to give my colleagues an update on uh, the Fast and Furious investigation that I've been conducting since last January 31st. For almost 11 months now, I've been investigating Fast and Furious, an operation of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, ATF. On December the 2nd, the Justice Department finally came clean about who helped draft its February 4th letter to Congress. That was a letter that I wrote that they responded to when I, since I opened the investigation on January 31st. It only took them a few days to get back a letter to me that had tremendous number of falsehoods in it. That letter falsely denied ATF whistleblower allegations that ATF walked guns. The revelation in the December 2nd documents of this year were the last straw for me. They, claimed, they, they admitted that that February 4th letter had falsehoods in it. I called for Assistant Secretary General Brewer to step down. And I don't do that lightly. Earlier documents had already shown that Mr. Brewer displayed a stunning lack of judgment in failing to respond adequately when told guns had walked in Operation Wide Receiver in the years 2006 to 2007. The December 2nd document showed that Mr. Brewer was far more informed during the drafting of the February 4th letter than he admitted before the Judiciary Committee just one month earlier. These two issues led me to call for the resignation of Mr. Brewer, the highest ranking official in the Justice Department who knew about gun walking in Operation Wide Receiver. The December 2nd documents also established a number, number of other key points. The first is that the Justice Department has a flawed process for responding to letters from Congress that involve whistleblowers. So any of my colleagues, any 99 other senators that are writing letters to the Justice Department understand that they have a flawed process if it involves whistleblowers to responding to us, and I will show that to you. In the cover letter that accompanied the documents, the Justice Department wrote that in drafting their February, February 4th response, which had these falsehoods in it, quote, department personnel relied on information provided by supervisors from the components in the best position to know the relevant facts. Well, they were listening to supervisors because they only listen to supervisors. That's the problem with not answering the letters in a truthful way to me five days later after I handed them to the Attorney General. And I'll show that in just a minute. Clearly, the Justice Department did not rely on those in the best position to know the facts since the letter was withdrawn on December the 2nd due to its inaccuracies. Now, I don't know how you can withdraw a letter that's in the public domain, but they just somehow withdraw the letter. The whistleblowers were in the best position to know the facts. Frontline personnel, not supervisors, were in the best position to know the facts not these senior bureaucrats or political appointees. Yet the department failed to provide credible process for whistleblowers, people that know what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, and other frontline personnel to provide information without fear of retaliation. Employees simply do not believe that they're free to report misconduct because they see what happens to those who speak out. They know it's a career killer because the ATF and the Justice Department culture protects those who retaliate against whistleblowers. Yet whistleblowers in this case spoke out anyway. In other words, these whistleblowers were speaking out, taking a chance on their professional future in federal government because they knew something wasn't right about the walking of guns. So they risked their career to make sure that truth was known. You know, the only crime committed by whistleblowers generally is the crime of committing truth. But when the Office of Legislative Affairs sought information to respond to my inquiries, it didn't ask these brave whistleblowers what happened. 
Instead, it simply relied on self-serving denials of senior officials at ATF headquarters or the criminal division here in D.C. or the U.S. attorneys in Arizona. In other words, the department took the word of the very officials the whistleblowers alleged had mismanaged the situation in the very first place without getting both sides of the story. The U.S. attorney has since admitted in testimony to congressional investigators that he was too strident when he first heard these accusations. He claimed he didn't know all the facts. You can't rely on the chain of command when you have a whistleblower. By definition, whistleblowers emerge because the chain of command is broken. Whistleblowers come to Congress because they're unsuccessful in getting their supervisors to address fraud, waste, and abuse. Sometimes those supervisors attempt to cover tracks and paper over the problem. That's why you have to get the story straight from the horse's mouth. You can't let the facts be filtered through multiple layers of bureaucracy. After all, the bureaucracy is filled with the same supervisors who should have done something about the problem in the very first place before whistleblowers even come forward. These problems are particularly prevalent in the federal government that is so very large. It is virtually impossible for anyone to ever be held accountable for anything. So it's crucial that those investigating whistleblower allegations go straight to those on the ground level with first-hand knowledge of the facts. Their goal should be to understand the underlying facts of the whistleblower allegations, not to intimidate whistleblowers into silence. Instead, inquiries all too often focus on the whistleblowers themselves and what skeletons they have in their closet. That approach is exactly what's wrong with the federal government and why it doesn't function as efficiently as it can. Because if more whistleblowers were listened to and wrongs were brought to the surface and uh, transparency ruled, there'd be more accountability. The focus should be on whether the accusations are true so that the problems can be corrected. Too often, however, the focus is on finding out what information the whistleblower disclosed so the agency can circle the wagons and build a defense. That needs to change. If the department is going to regain its credibility, it needs to provide straight answers, not talking points and spin. The only way to provide straight answers is to make sure that you get straight answers in the first place. That's one reason that we have pushed in our investigation to be able to interview frontline personnel. The Justice Department objected in a letter Tuesday night. In that letter, the Justice Department also objected to us talking to first or second level supervisors. This is exactly the sort of approach that prevents key information from getting to senior officials and to Congress and impeding Congress's constitutional responsibility to see that the laws are faithfully executed. In other words, we don't just pass laws and say that's the end of it. We have to pass laws to make sure that we're a check on the executive branch of government. And that means do the constitutional job of oversight. That means ask questions. That means we're entitled to answers unless somebody's trying to cover up something. And when they try to cover up something in the bureaucracy, I always tell them, you get stonewalled. Eventually, the truth's going to come out. And the more truth that comes out, the more egg you're going to have on your face. And Mr. Brewer is one of those that has tremendous egg on his face. Justice cites the so-called lying personnel policy for refusing to provide officials for voluntary interviews. Now, the policy is based purely on nothing but the department's own preferences. This isn't any law or statute or even case law. The department has frequently set aside the policy and made exceptions. For example, line attorneys gave transcribed interviews under oath to Congress in the 1992 Rocky Flats nuclear weapons facility investigation. As recently as October, Assistant U.S. Attorney Rachel Lieber, the line attorney responsible for the anthrax investigations, participated in an interview with the PBS Frontline. 
How can the Justice Department tell me or argue to Congress that Congress should not be allowed access to lying attorneys when they give that same kind of access to the press? Those are the kind of lying personnels, the kinds of lying personnel, the individuals who have the actual answers. I kind of surmise that the reason the Justice Department will let a U.S. attorney or some FBI agents be interviewed on television, that some public affairs officer has looked at it and said, well, you know, this is a good story. This is going to make us look good. But when Congress wants to interview lying people, no. And we got a constitutional responsibility to do that. I'd like to suggest that the Justice Department let the public affairs people make a decision of who can talk to Congress or not. Because it might make them look a little better if they'll let us talk to Congress. Or are they afraid we might find something out? It's just as irritating as heck. In this case, had the Justice Department gone to the horse's mouth before sending an inaccurate letter to me on February the 4th, they would have been able to get the story straight. The memo that I have here that I want to, I'm not going to read from the memo, but I want to hold it up. The memo is from an ATF line agent who substantiated the claims of the first ATF whistleblowers. I ask you, man, as consent that copy be placed in the record immediately after my remarks. Without objection. It is dated February the 3rd, 2011, the day before the Justice Department sent their letter to me. The memo was passed up his, ch his chain in response to investigators on my staff talking to him about a Operation Fast and Furious. He accurately described the problems with Fast and Furious. What he said was consistent with the claims that I had already heard from other whistleblowers. Information like this is why I was skeptical days later when the department sent its February 4th letter to me denying the allegations. In other words, I had proof that they were lying to us. The agent wrote in the memo about being ordered by Fast and Furious case agent to hold back in their surveillance so that they did, didn't, quote, unquote, burn the operation. While watching straw purchasers hand off weapons to traffickers, violating the laws of this country, but encouraged to do it by the own Justice Department, the case agent, quote, told all the agents to leave the immediate area, end of quote. While a crime was being committed, the agent said to the agents, to leave the area immediately. The memo explicitly, set, explicitly says, quote, the transaction between the suspects took place and the vehicle that took possession of the firearms eventually left the area without agents following it. A crime's committed, U.S. agents there, just let them move on. After the phone call with my staff, the ATF agent's supervisor requested that he write this memo documenting what he had told my investigators. He was passed up the chain all the way to ATF leadership. We know that because there are emails attached, attaching the memo sent to senior headquarter officials. However, the Justice Department has refused to provide copies of those emails and will only allow them to be reviewed at Justice Department headquarters. The memo has also refused to, or the department has also refused to provide a copy of this memo. My staff had to obtain it from confidential sources. One of the questions yet to be answered is who in the Justice Department saw the memo and when? Either way, once the Justice Department got a hold of it, they tried to keep it under wraps by refusing to give me a copy. They made my staff go to the Justice Department to view it, even though the entire memo simply recounts information that was already provided to my staff. It's just embarrassing to the department because it shows that the truth 
was easily knowable before the false denial was sent to Congress on February the 4th. If they had asked for first-hand documentation like this memo when they first got my letter in January, we wouldn't be where we are today. The second point these documents establish is that Maine Justice had problems of its own. It wasn't all the fault of the ATF or the U.S. Attorney. Mr. Brewer, Deputy, Deputy Assistant Attorney General Jason Weinstein, uh, Weinstein participated in drafting a false statement. The Justice Department February 4th letter read, quote, ATF makes every effort to interdict weapons that have been purchased illegally and prevent their transfer transportation to Mexico, end of quote. Documents show that that, that that line originated in a phone conversation February the 1st, 2011, between Justice Department Legislative Affairs, Assistant Director Billy Hoover from ATF, and Jason Weinstein from Maine Justice's Criminal Division. Like Assistant Attorney General Brewer, Mr. Weinstein knew that ATF had let hundreds of weapons walk in Operation Wide Receiver, which was an earlier, smaller scale case than Fast and Furious. In fact, in April 2010, he brought that fact to the attention of Mr. Brewer, his boss. Now, April two, 2010 is eight months before I got involved in this investigation. His email to Mr. Brewer about wide receiver said, quote, as you'll recall from Jim's briefing, ATF let a bunch of guns walk in efforts to get upstream conspirators, but only got straws and didn't recover many guns. Some were recovered in Mexico after being used in crimes, end of quote. It's ironic that that's how Mr. Weinstein described wide receiver. He was one of the officials who authorized wiretaps in Fast and Furious. Therefore, he was in a position to know that exact same description applied to Fast and Furious. Yet he allowed the myth to be perpetrated that ATF would never do such a thing. Mr. Weinstein saw the Justice Department's very first draft of the letter to Congress. In fact, as one of his Justice Department colleagues in the Deputy Attorney General's office said, quote, CRM, which uh, parenthetically happens to be the criminal division, and OLA, which is the Office of Legislative Affairs. So let me back up. CRM and OLA basically drafted it. Mr. Weinstein, that's the end of quote. Mr. Weinstein knew the letter contained a blatantly false line, yet he did nothing to correct it, and that line thus remained in, a, in every successive draft of the letter. <clears throat> On December 2 this year, the Justice Department's latest spin was that its statement that ATF, quote, uh, quote, that ATF makes every effort to interdict weapons, end of quote, was, quote, unquote, aspirational. Nevertheless, that didn't stop them from withdrawing the letter for inaccuracies. Perhaps the aspirational language should be saved for mission statements. Responses to specific and serious allegations ought to, in a common sense way, ought to just stick to the facts, right? This was an oversight letter. I was not asking for some feel-good, fuzzy message about what ATF aspired to. I was asking for simple facts. A U.S. Border Patrol agent had died, and at the scene of his death, were two guns from Fast and Furious. So his death was connected to the ATF operation. Whistleblowers were reaching outside of the chain of command because supervisors wouldn't listen. Instead of treating these allegations with the kind of seriousness they deserved, the Justice Department resorted to damage control. 
Now, I don't know what else my investigation is going to uncover, but we're going to pursue it until we get to the end of it, because my goal is to find out who at the highest level of government, in justice or the White House, approved this and get them fired. Make sure that the Terry family gets all of their information about the death of their son. To this point, they've had hardly anything. And three, to make sure a stupid program like Walking Guns, Fast and Furious, etc., never happens again. Just this week, the investigation revealed that shortly after the February 4th letter, Lanny Brewer asked Mr. Weinstein to write up an analytical memo of Fast and Furious. This suggests that Mr. Brewer and his deputy, Mr. Weinstein, were down in the, in the weeds on Operation Fast and Furious a lot earlier than previously admitted. Mr. Weinstein was in an excellent position to write such a memo since Mr. Brewer has acknowledged that Mr. Weinstein was, a one, of, was one of the individuals who approved wiretaps in the summer of 2010 as part of Operation Fast and Furious. However, we had to learn of this memo from sources not from the Justice Department, but from outside of the Justice Department. The Justice Department has not provided it to us, even though it is clearly responsive to a House Oversight and Government Reform Committee's October 25th subpoena. This type of maneuvering is what got the Justice Department in trouble to begin with. The Justice Department should produce this document immediately, along with all the other responsive documents. <clears throat> this investigation will continue. People must be held accountable. The Justice Department must stop stonewalling today.